The Walk of the Spirit, The Walk of Power, The Vital Role of Praying in Tongues by Dave Roverson. This is Evangelist Lloyd Cole, and I am reading from Dave Roverson's book. This is chapter 4. Every chapter in the book begins with a word of prophecy. This is the prophecy at the beginning of chapter 4. When I call you and separate you through ordination to an operation that I place you in, my power will qualify you to fulfill that office from within. For I have made all things possible to him who believeth. Therefore approach not my presence in your own understanding, or in the ideals, creeds, and doctrines as men would put them forth. For I place within you an anointing that cannot lie. That anointing is truth and will teach you all things. Yield yourself to my spirit for the purposes of edification, and I will lift you up. I will build you into every operation that I have separated you unto, and I will qualify you by my power. Chapter 4, Diversities of Tongues in God's Government. We've seen that the diversities of tongues is an entire operation of God placed into God's government to serve a crucial purpose. To deny it is to deny the perfecting of the body of Christ. So let's find out about the role of diversities of tongues in God's government and the reason God would designate an entire operation to it. I want you to understand what he has made available to us through this awesome gift of speaking with tongues. A gift that Satan has deceived many into believing is either obsolete or insignificant. The unique nature of diversities of tongues. There is only one operation we can fulfill immediately after we are born again. The eighth operation of diversities of tongues. The moment we receive Jesus as Savior, we can also receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and begin to speak with other tongues, which begins our spiritual qualification for any and all of the other operations to which we may be qualified. A person cannot become a mighty apostle or prophet five minutes after he's born again, even if that is what he's called to be. He first must become qualified, trained, prepared, and seasoned by the Holy Spirit before God will separate him to the office he's called to. That's true with any of the first seven operations listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Not everyone is qualified to teach God's Word. You can tell that, you can tell that by the people who nod off to sleep while some ministers teach. A person can't immediately enter into a full-blown ministry operating in the working of miracles or gifts of healings either. In every one of the first seven operations, including helps and governments, a person must, be, must first be found faithful and receive the equipping of the Holy Ghost before he can fulfill the operation to which he is called. On the other hand, a person can move into the eighth operation instantaneously with his rebirth. Suppose the person responds to an altar call and says, I receive Jesus as Savior. Then someone steps up and says to him, You just received God's nature. Now you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He asks, What are you talking about? He learns that because his spirit just became the receptor of a new nature. He is now able to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I'd like to be filled with the Holy Ghost, he says. Then receive the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. All of a sudden, the person's chin starts shaking. Speak it out, he is instructed. His mouth starts forming words, and soon he is speaking in tongues. He dances around for days, speaking in his new language with great joy. Why did God design it that way? Why are tongues available to us instantaneously with our rebirth? Because praying in tongues has everything to do with our becoming prepared and qualified for our particular calling. And as we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit is able to build into our heart the understanding of God's will for our personal lives. Sometimes people get the baptism of the Holy Ghost mixed up with the new birth. However, there is a great difference between being born again and receiving the indwelling fullness of the Holy Spirit's presence. The Holy Spirit is a person just as each of us is a person. When we were born again, we received Him in the creative process that caused us to become new creatures, new creations. 
But we didn't receive him in his fullness until we were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now he lives inside us, partnering with us in prayer, empowering our lives, and bringing revelation of the word as we walk in obedience to God. It is God's will that the moment we are born again, we lift our hands in submission and praise to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the very best way to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But the devil has managed to separate the new birth from the baptism of the Holy Spirit through divisions of doctrines, so that now, as a rule, the two experiences don't occur together. The Miracle of Tongues in the Baptism of the Holy Spirit Actually, the devil does whatever he can to prevent people from ever receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. For example, many times I minister to people who have been in a hundred other prayer lines seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but who have always left disappointed. They respond when I make an altar call, and like so many ministers before me, I pray for them. Their mouth moves, but they make no sounds. So I encourage them by saying, Why don't you just speak out what your lips are already mouthing? The majority of those who take my suggestion immediately begin to speak in tongues. Why is that? Because the moment the person of the Holy Spirit fills a believer, the first thing he does is to start creating the supernatural language of tongues on the inside of the believer's spirit for his own personal edification. In my own experience, the first evidence that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit was what Isaiah 28:11 called stammering lips. For with stammering lips and another tongue will, his peop will he speak to this people. One night when I came to the altar to be filled with the Holy Spirit, something came over me. All of a sudden, my chin, mouth, and tongue all started to move. My mouth seemed to be out of control. I thought, what's the matter with my mouth? I didn't know what the moment I didn't know that the moment I said fill me with the Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost had begun to create his supernatural words in my spirit so the words came out in stammering lips because I was afraid to say them out loud I was sure it would be just me speaking I didn't realize that my mouth was actually shaping an entire supernatural language of the Holy Spirit but later I was worshiping God at home, and the Holy Ghost came upon me. My mouth began to move the same way it had the night before at church. However, by this time I had learned about Acts 2-4, which says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this time, instead of fighting off the urge to speak out those words, I yielded to the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. And the longer I yielded, the more the Holy Ghost's rivers of living water poured out of me. John 7, 38 and 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. It wasn't long before I was speaking a full prayer language by the power of the Holy Spirit. Benefits of Praying in Tongues Now, if God the Holy Spirit literally creates this language in our spirit, what kind of prayer could it possibly be? What benefits could it possibly hold for us? We've already seen some of the benefits of praying in other tongues, and we'll discuss several of them in depth later on. But I want to just mention a few of the benefits right now. For one thing, the Holy Spirit came into our spirit to bring us revelation knowledge of the cross and everything that Jesus has become to us. Also, on the day you and I spoke with tongues, a viable, powerful working of God's government came into operation within our spirit, designed to give us and cause us to understand what no man can give us through natural means, spiritual authority. This spiritual power and authority is the means God gives us to overcome torment, worry, fear, and the hopelessness that can take over our lives when we move from one overwhelming situation to another 
continually losing ground. Praying in other tongues also supplies the power to overcome character flaws, those deep-seated character traits that keep cropping up and robbing us of our stamina and initiative to overcome in the face of the common testings and trials that precede almost every major victory and promotion by God. Praying in tongues always affects us in a positive way. God says that it edifies us. 1 Corinthians 14.4 In Jude 20, he says that it builds us up on our most holy faith. As we faithfully spend time praying in tongues, our lives begin to be transformed. The Word of God begins to come alive as we place our spirit, which is the candle of the Lord, in the hands of the expert illuminator. Proverbs 20, verse 27. We need to understand the one to whom the Father turned us over for our instruction, the one to whom we can lend our spirit in prayer. Remember, it is the third person of the Trinity himself, the Holy Spirit of promise, who has filled us. We should consider it our privilege and heart's desire to lock ourselves away with the Holy Spirit in prayer. He has no problems or concerns of his own to pray about, he is not the one who needs illumination, yet he is more than willing to pray through us for all that concerns us. He is eager to teach us and to guide us into all truth. John 16, 13. It doesn't matter what kind of carnal state we are in when we are first born again. It doesn't matter if we've been stealing money, lying, drinking whiskey, or stalking women down dark alleys. When we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, that first simple little gift of speaking in tongues goes into operation for one reason, to edify or build us up. That's why we are not to wait to pray in tongues until we feel sufficiently spiritual. But Brother Oberson, I live a carnal lifestyle. That can, that can change. God wants to bring you from there to here from a life of carnality to a life of freedom and victory. That's why the Holy Spirit came, bringing His supernatural language with Him. No matter how spiritual or unspiritual you may feel, when you start praying in the Holy Ghost, you have begun the edification process. He gave gifts to all men. So let's go back now to Ephesians 4 to take a closer look at God's design for the working of the body of Christ. It will help us understand the role of diversities of tongues in God's government. He, Jesus, that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till... We all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's Ephesians 4, 10-13. During the 80s, I sat under a lot of teaching on this passage of Scripture. This is how I was taught. Jesus ascended on high, and he gave the fivefold ministry offices as a gift to the church. For what purpose? for the perfecting of the saints, so that each and every believer can do the work of the ministry, which then brings edification to the body of Christ. Does this interpretation sound familiar? Well, I tell you what this teaching did for us ministers. Also, everywhere we went to minister, the congregations treated us as if we were the President of the United States. I must admit that I didn't mind riding the waves of all that glory, especially in my more carnal early early years i enjoyed the fire i enjoyed the fire out of it at camp meetings we ministers would be introduced something like jesus ascended on high led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and now let's welcome one of those gifts to the body of christ evangelist and teacher dave roberson somewhere deep inside a thought lurked that i didn't even articulate to myself you poor little peasants, I was singled out as a special gift to you for your maturing, 
so you could do the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. But the whole reason you're being edified and matured is the great gift that resides down on the inside of me. I began to think I was something special. Thank God, since then he has healed me of that unhealthy attitude. I could always tell which churches had received the governmental teaching on gifts to the body of Christ, because I was always treated very respectfully in those churches. For instance, I have had a Rolls Royce assigned to me for my transportation, and a man put on duty in the room next to mine just in case I got a whim at 2 o'clock in the morning for an ice cream cone. I would be lying to you if I said I didn't like that kind of treatment. But some of us ministers began to expect that kind of special treatment as our God-given right. If everything in the hotel room wasn't just right, we wanted to complain. Where is my super-duper fruit basket? Where is the guy who's supposed to be in the next room just waiting to drive me to the meeting? I can remember feeling insulted if the host church didn't have a car parked in front immediately after the service so I could go out and get in it. My, my wife was the first one to really recognize my wrong attitude. We were ministering at a, a big camp meeting in Omaha, Nebraska with several big name ministers. I was the low man on the totem pole, so I was given the afternoon services, the time when most people want to eat and nap between meetings. But I didn't mind, even though most of the other guest ministers never attended my meetings. Then God began moving mightily in those afternoon services. The man in charge came to me and said, We would like you to receive the offerings at every service. So from then on, at every service, I would get up and teach a little from the Word, and then receive the offering. But the minister scheduled to preach never came into the service until after the offering was taken. It was starting to bother me. One evening, Rosalie and I were riding in the elevator, and someone attending the camp meeting spouted out to me above the heads of the people, Boy, the other ministers ought to hear you teach. I replied sourly, Yeah, if they hung around long enough, they would. My wife caught the prideful attitude behind my response and took me to task about it later. But you see, the teaching I was receiving on God's government wasn't helping my attitude. Every time I heard Ephesians 4 taught that way, my head would get a little fatter as I became a little more convinced that I was a special gift to the body. Thank God, if we keep praying in the Holy Ghost and speaking mysteries to the Father, He will straighten us out. God sent me for a long run on a short rope and jerked the slack out of me regarding my wrong prideful attitude. He revealed to my spirit the role that the other operations, including diversities of tongues, play in his government. I was so shocked when I first understood what he was saying, I said, Oh Lord, you weren't exalting us ministers at all. You see, it's good to give honor where honors due and to show respect to a minister of the gospel. But if you think that his calling is more honored than yours, think again. God is no respecter of persons. You are also a precious gift to the body of Christ. Whatever your calling or office, it is every bit as important as a minister's calling in God's eyes. You should be treated with just as much respect as any minister has shown. So what is Paul saying in Ephesians 4, 10 through 12? Well, to understand that, you have to look back at 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28 where Paul says something very similar. First he says, Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Compare that with Ephesians 4, 7. But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So in context, Paul is referring to the entire body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Then in verse 28, Paul says, and God has set some in the church. He goes on to list all eight operations of God. Just as in Ephesians 4.11, he begins with the fivefold ministry. Then he goes on to list helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. You see, when Jesus ascended on high, he presented his shed blood to the Father for the redemption of mankind, sat down at the right hand of the Father, and said, It is finished. Then he began to fill all in all. 
the entire body of Christ with his gifts. Three categories of gifts for three purposes. Now let's look at the divine sequence found in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. We know that Jesus only ascended on high once and gave gifts unto men. But for the sake of teaching you how 1 Corinthians 12, 28 ties into Ephesians 4, 11, let's just say that, hypothetically speaking, Jesus ascended on high in three different phases, one time for each of three categories of gifts. The first time, Jesus grabbed a handful of fivefold ministry gifts and threw them down into the body of Christ. A whole group of people stood up to receive the gifts. One said, Oh my gosh, I am an apostle to the body. Another said, I am separated to the office of the prophet. Someone else said, I am called to be an evangelist. Others exclaimed, The gift of teaching has landed on me, or I am called to be a pastor. Those who were called to these ministry offices stood up, recognized their calling, and said, We have received grace for this. For what purpose did he give these ministry offices? He gave them for the perfecting of the mature or the maturing of the saints. Ephesians 4:12. Those in the fivefold ministry are supposed to supply the body of Christ with the revelation knowledge they receive from the Lord. They are to minister the word of God to bring the saints from spiritual milk to strong meat. In this way, the saints can mature until their transformation is complete. Then let's say Jesus looked the body over and said, The fivefold ministry offices are not enough for the smooth operation of the body of Christ. I must ascend and grab another handful. So in this hypothetical illustration, he ascended on high a second time. He grabbed another handful of gifts and threw them down into the body. This time thousands upon thousands of people stood up and said, Why, I am called to helps or I've received the gift of governments. And to these, Jesus said, Good for you. I have given you your grace, and it is just as much a gift to the church as the apostle or prophet. And what do helps and governments do in the body of Christ? They fulfill the second purpose listed in Ephesians 4.12. They do the work of the ministry. But as Jesus looked the body over one more time, he said, it isn't enough. My people still have to learn to operate out of my spirit. So he ascended one more time to finish equipping the body of Christ. This time he grabbed the eighth operation of God, diversities of tongues, and threw it into the entire body of Christ. Every person in the body should have stood up and received this gift. Why? Because the most important manifestation of the diversities of tongues is the direct operation of the Holy Spirit within the believer's spirit to edify himself. That is the purpose that this one operation fulfills. It is given for the edification of the saints. Until what happens? Until we all come into the unity of the faith. Until we quit being deceived by the cunning craftiness of men. Until we fulfill our call, speaking the truth in love. Every one of us is supposed to receive this operation because if we are ever going to come into the unity of the faith, we must learn how to release the power of the Holy Spirit, our teacher who dwells inside of us. He is more than willing to pray hour after hour in divine secrets and mysteries before the Father to help us prepare spiritually for the operation to which God separated us at our rebirth. So when Jesus ascended on high, he gave three categories of gifts for three separate purposes. The fivefold ministry for the maturing of the saints, helps and governments for the work of the ministry, and diversities of tongues for the edifying of the body of Christ. See chart on page 79. These three categories were given so that we would all come into the unity of the faith and the fullness of the knowledge of of the Son of God, Ephesians 4.13. The devil has tried to utterly confuse the church regarding the subject of tongues. He wants us to get discouraged that we just quit using this divine gift. Yet, of the three categories of gifts given unto men, God designated an entire category to one lone operation, the diversities of tongues. That one operation holds a third of the categories that it takes to bring the body of Christ into the unity of the faith. 
Think about that the next time someone tells you it doesn't do any good to pray in tongues, or that you can pray too much in tongues. Therefore, it would behoove us to find out from His Word the important role this operation is to play in our lives. The truth is, if all we ever fulfilled in the body of Christ was the eighth operation of diversities of tongues, we would still be a gift to the body of Christ for the edification of the saints. But no matter what operation, no matter what other operation we are called by God to fulfill, we have access to this third category and the edification it provides as we pray in the Holy Ghost. Yet despite the importance God places on diversities of tongues, many in the body of Christ want to downplay or even exclude it. But if the category Jesus gave for the edifying of the saints is excluded, how are we going to come into the unity of the faith? It takes all three categories of gifts fulfilling all three purposes listed in Ephesians 4.12 for the body of Christ to arrive at the place of unity God intended, and as each measure of the gift of Christ fulfills his or her call, the body of Christ will begin to stand up unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13 Why is all this necessary? Ephesians 4.14 and 15 tells us that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Isn't it interesting why we need these gifts that Jesus gave unto men? We need them so we won't be deceived by the cunning craftiness of men. We also need them so we can be purged of all lying and start speaking the truth. When we are speaking the truth in purity of spirit and we're not being deceived anymore, we can then start the qualification process for our calling, the empowerment of spiritual gifts.